And as we think about this game, I want us to think about the approaches that we often take to leadership. Where, like I said before, we have the title, and that's the approach we take. The truth about titles is something that I find pretty interesting. And, and, and as we study case studies on different companies and leaders, what I find are some, that there are some interesting things going on with titles nowadays. I had a friend who um, their little brother was hired at a new firm, and they were, their new title was VP of Analytics. I asked my friend, I said, that's really interesting because your friend, just, your little brother just graduated from college two years ago. And he said, yeah, that's true. I said, so how is he a VP of analytics already? He said, I asked him the same question. What I found out was that at his company, they found that their clients are sick of dealing with entry-level employees. So they simply changed the names of the titles. And VP is an entry-level position. I have another friend who his title is team lead. I asked him, wow, you really moved up. You're team lead? So how many people are on your team? He said, I don't, I don't have a team. He said, well, I'm part of a team, but I don't like have my own team. I said, but you're team lead, which most people would think you do what? You lead a team. So many people do you lead? He said, well, I don't lead any. I said, what is, you know, what is that? Doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but he has a fancy title and he's okay with it. There's another study that says that 85% of people would downgrade their title for a 10% pay increase. So what we're seeing out there is that those who have the titles don't always want them, and those who want them don't always have them. But leadership is not a title. Leadership, rather, is a behavior. But we can only get to that behavior, we can only get to those outcomes, if we start to think differently about what a title is. I need somebody with good handwriting. Who has good handwriting? You do, great, perfect. Um, so can you help me out? So there's a little bit of a delay sometimes, as you can tell. So all you do is write here. Perfect. So I want you to just write down what people say. So let's do something. What comes to mind when we think of a leader? Throw it out. Anybody? Vision. So write down vision. Right there in the back. Decisive. She said decisive. Okay. Charismatic. Okay. Anything else? Tru wow, that was nice. Had an echo effect there. Trust. Presence. Strategic. All right. So let's hold on. Let's let's slow down a little bit. Trust. Strategic. I should have asked who has good handwriting and can write a thousand miles an hour because that's what we came to. So I apologize. We're going to slow down for you. What what was what were the other two words? Empowering. Empowering. Knowledgeable. Motivator of people. Okay, we'll get those up there. Let's throw out one more. Let's close out the list. Real. I like it. Authentic. Real. Did you write those in different orders or did it just come up like that? Oh, okay. Because sometimes the program does things where like, people in the audience are like, that guy writes from right to left. What's going on with him? But I'm like, I promise it's the program. So I just didn't know if it just happened to you. So, so thank you for writing that for us, because this exact exercise, they did, a, they did an interview with a thousand people, and they asked them the same question. What are the things that come to mind when we think of a leader? And this is what it turned out to be. Nope. This is what they found. Take a second, check it out. Communicating clearly, teaching, facilitation, building teams, subject matter, expertise, coaching, mentoring, using stories, tools like stories and practical examples. Title, power, position didn't even make the list. Not, not that it didn't make above 10%, it didn't make the list. So why off, so often do we think about leadership in that way? Because the reality is people, when they're interviewed, don't. 
But then you put that in real context and you put that in real situations within organizations and people who were hired because of their leadership skills often don't step up to the plate. And so what we're finding is that titles don't need to equal leadership with impacto. You know, Philip of Macedonia had an interesting quote, and I think he almost got it right. An army of deer led by a lion is more to be feared than an army of lions led by a deer. Would we agree with that? I think that's a fair approach. But I say he almost got it right because I think there's something more to it, something much deeper. And that is an army of lions led by a lion is to be feared most of all. So it's when we get organizations to understand that everyone in the organization is a lion. That we don't look at it from an org chart perspective and say, here's a lion and here are the followers. But that at different times, everybody steps up to the plate and that there are all lions involved. My colleague Mark Sanborn says that leadership is an invitation to greatness we extend to others. That's what leadership is. It's something that we invite others to be a part of. But the biggest question I get, no matter where I go, is when is it right to lead, Paul? I work in an organization, I'm at a, I'm at a meeting, and is it appropriate to step up and lead the meeting when my senior manager is there? Maybe not. Is it important for me to make a decision and move on without addressing those above me or asking them for guidance before I move into a new division before I take a certain action. Maybe not. But the times that it, it is appropriate is when we think of something that increases ROI. Now, we think of ROI as a financial term. Most people do. But I think of it a little bit differently. And I think of it as any, we should lead and we should step up to lead any time we can increase and improve relationships outcomes and improvements. So if you are in a situation and you don't know what action to take, think about it that way. If you can improve one of those three things, then it's time to step up. Factory floors, phone calls, frappuccinos. There's a, there's a company in central Michigan, 500 employees, in a factory, it wasn't a union factory, Employees were getting paid less than they were down the street at the union factory, and they were having better hours and work schedules at the union factory. There was a guy named Tony Sardo. Now, Tony Sardo didn't have a title at all, but he was a leader within his group. In fact, he would do things like they would have sack lunches that they would all bring, and he convinced them, which kind of happened organically, to all at the, at the beginning of their lunch period to pour their bag, their sack lunch, out on the tables, draw numbers, and start choosing. That was the camaraderie. Whatever they brought, if somebody picked a better number than they did, somebody else would get their meal and they would get somebody else's. And then they would sit down and they would visit and they would talk about, oh, Mark, your wife, she makes an incredible apple pie. I'm glad I chose number two and you chose number 10 because I got it first. But it wasn't that they were jealous of each other and it weren't that they were upset. It was that camaraderie. And a year and a half later from when the time Tony came on board, the other union factory tried to come and hire their employees. And everybody on Tony's team stayed. Although one of the other teams, 40% left, one of the other teams, 35% left. But on Tony's team, they all stayed. And they asked those employees later on, why did you stay when you could have been part of a union, you could have been paid higher wages. One of the employees, and I think this represents what true leadership is best, they said, I would give up better hours, higher pay, and being part of a union to work for Tony any day. Because that was what he provided. He provided value as a leader to them that was worth far more than any dollar amount could have ever had. Phone calls. I checked into a hotel the other day. The woman at the front desk was quite pleasant. I walked to my room. I was there 15 minutes, and she called me. She said, Paul, how is your room? I said, it's nice. Thanks for calling. I thought there was something else that she was going to tell me next. I thought maybe somebody was at the front desk, and that was just the way she started the phone conversation. She said, great. 
I'm glad you like it. Please let us know if there's anything else we can do. Now, I was intrigued by this because I've stayed at hotels all over the country, all over the world, and rarely does something like this happen. So I walked down to the front desk and I said, Katie, her name was Katie. I said, Katie, I said, were you instructed to do that? Is that part of a protocol? And she said, oh, no, Mr. Moya. I said, so why did you do that? She said, well, when you walked in here, you didn't look so great. Which I was like, okay. She said, I'm just being honest. You look like you had a tough day. You look like you had been on a plane all day, which I had. And you sounded like, man, your day was just not one of those days. Not a good day for you. She said, I knew you had had a bad day. And I wanted your stay with us not only to be at the status quo level, but I wanted your stay with us to be the best part of your day. She said, I wasn't instructed by anybody to ask you that. I simply did it. Because I wanted to provide a service that next time you come back to Lubbock, Texas, you decide to stay with us. She did something hoping that the outcome improved would be that next time I go back to Lubbock, I stay at their hotel. And I guarantee you that every time I stay in Lubbock, I will stay at that hotel. Not because it's the nicest, not because it's the fanciest, certainly not because it's the cheapest, but because of her action that day. She was not a manager. She simply was working at the front desk and decided to step up. Finally, Frappuccino's Starbucks, that was started by a barista at one of the local shops. They took it to their manager, their manager said no. They took it to their manager two weeks later after they improved it, their manager said no. They took it three weeks later, the manager said, okay, I'll pass on the recipe. Corporate got a hold of it. Corporate rejected it for years until finally Starbucks brought it on board and it's now made them hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. All because some employee in one of the Starbucks someplace in America, decided I'm not going to let not having a title stop me from doing something that I can add value, that can approach leadership from a way where it increases ROI. These are three examples of small things that that had big impacts that people just like all of us can choose to do every single day. And the next question I get is not only when to lead, but how to lead. And it's a really interesting question because people, they have all these ideas of what, it, what makes sense and what's good leadership approach and what's a bad leadership approach. I'm going to deliver six principles that I think will add value to everything you do. They will allow you to have credibility as a leader. The first approach is self-mastery. People often ask me, well, Paul, how, in your studies and working with different companies, how do, how do leaders become credible? Because maybe somebody's smart, sure, maybe somebody's talented, but if they're not credible, who is going to follow them? And I think the best way to gain credibility as a leader is through self-mastery. If you don't know what you're talking about, it is really hard to get people to follow you. In fact, if you don't know what you're doing and you don't know the answer to the question that you're answering, but you still provide an answer at the meeting, then people find out that was actually not correct. It's actually detrimental to your success. So self-mastery is one of the easiest and most simple approaches to leadership. The difference between a hero and a zero. Heroes... They take action. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, zeros take action. Nothing wrong with that. Most people want a leader who takes action. But a hero, they do something different. They take responsibility. When things go well, they say, team, bravo. Thank you for the work you put in. Thank you for doing X, Y, and Z, and this is what it added to the team, and look at the outcome. Wow. Let's give ourselves a round of applause. Let's take this moment to recognize what we've done. But they don't only do it when things are good. They do it when times are bad as well, when a project fails, when an idea fails. They don't say, oh, that was their idea and I just pushed it on through to management. They say, well, we messed up. A great example of this is Domino's Pizza. Now, Domino's Pizza... Some of you may remember this. They've gone through some interesting changes. Now, 
what Domino's Pizza did is they recognized that. So let's, let's kind of put together what Domino's Pizza went through. Now, there are three things that are important. Brand Keys did a research study years ago in 2009, right at the height when, when Domino's Pizza was going through their challenges. They did a research study, and they found that three things were most important when it comes to, pro to the product of pizza and employees being proud of what they are serving and consumers wanting to buy more of it. The first is price. Now, if you've ever bought Domino's Pizza in your life, you know that Domino's Pizza is not a specialty product. It is certainly not expensive by any means. They were actually number one in price. But the second, convenience. Also, they were number one. If you've ever bought Domino's Pizza, you remember their rule. What is it? 30 minutes or it's free. 30 minutes or less or it's free. Pretty convenient if you ask me. So they're number one in price and they're number one in convenience. But Brand Keys found a third component that's critically important, and that is taste. They were dead last. We've thought for a long time, if you think about business, we've thought for a long time that if you were the best in price, you could be successful. Then we found that that doesn't work. You can't just be number one in price or number one in convenience or number one in taste. So we said, well, what if you're number one in two areas? So what if you're number one in price and you're number one in convenience? Because now you are leader in both of these areas. What happened then? Domino's is a perfect example. They were number one in price, number one in convenience. It didn't work. We now have to be leaders in three. So what did Domino's do? They could have said, they could have swept it under the rug. But they did the exact opposite. They did the one thing that consultants came in and told them, do not do this. Because the CEO stepped forward and the management team and leaders within the company, actually leaders without titles, brought the, the idea forward that they should redo everything. The management team at first didn't want to, but eventually they decided that it was good. So instead of doing what consultants told them and sweeping it under the rug and slowly changing recipes, they changed it completely, and they told people they were changing it. In fact, there were, if you remember, they had commercials with the CEO saying, we messed up. And then there was a clip of a person right after them saying, your pizza tastes like cardboard. Think about that. They advertised to the world that people who were giving reviews said, your pizza tastes like cardboard. They launched an entire marketing campaign around this. They became what I would call a hero because they were able to take responsibility for their product. What did that result in? Well, sales increased over 200% when they came out with a new recipe, when they came out with a new approach. Over 200% increase in sales, even though consultants told them not to do it. So I want you to think about what that means in terms of us as leaders. And you may be wondering, well, Paul, your point is around self-mastery, but you're give us, giving us an example of a company. That doesn't make any sense. My point is that taking responsibility is huge as a leader, and Domino's Pizza is a perfect example of it. But what about for us as leaders? Now, there are three things that I want to talk to you about in terms of self-mastery, and they are very, very simple. They are what I would call the three C's. Now, three C's, if you take something away from the next five minutes, listen closely on these because I think when we talk about credibility as a leader, when we talk about what it takes to move up, when we talk about what it takes to have power with the people around us, whether or not we have a title, these three C's, this is what it's about. The first, it's about who you are as a person. Character. Why people trust you. If you can't be trusted as a leader, it doesn't really matter what you know. The second one is competence. Why people emulate you. And the third, connections. Why people are influenced by you. Now, as we talked about before, you can't just be this, you can't just be this, you can't just be this. You have to 
be all of it. Character, competence, connections. Because unless you have the competence, people won't listen. Unless you have the character, people won't trust you. But if you don't have the connections, how is somebody going to know that you're the right person for that team if they don't know who you are? If they see you walking down the halls, they don't know who you are, they're simply not going to be able to view you in the way that you want them to. Character, competence, connections. I find it interesting that when we work with companies and study, what do you hear when, they, when you're out recruiting people? Often they talk to seniors in, in, at universities or they talk to people who are coming out of grad school and those individuals say, I would like a company where I can grow, where I can learn, where I have the opportunity to do something really cool. But then those people come into companies, and I've done it myself. I am not at all above this or any different. I've done this many, many times. What we, what we saw when we came into a company with all these different courses and all these different ways that we can learn, we saw, wow, what an opportunity that I can learn, that I can grow. And we're there a year, or we're there 18 months, or we're there a couple years, or we're there 10 years. And somebody says, hey, we need to go to, you, we're gonna, the whole team's going to go to training two Fridays from now. And what's the first thing that happens? Oh, another training. Man, I have all these obligations. But when we came into the company, we saw it as an opportunity. Now we see it as an obligation. Somehow it evolves. Somehow it changes. And it cer has certainly happened to me too. So the question today is, is it an obligation or is it an opportunity? Here are a few different opportunities within General Mills that if you take advantage of, you can have that opportunity to come up as a leader. So when we think about leadership action points, the first principle is self-mastery. Three things that you can do very easily. Pick one C. Whatever it is, character, competence, connections. Don't try to do everything at once. Pick one of the C's for the next week. Say, I'm going to focus on competence. I'm going to focus on my trade, on my skill. I'm going to get better at it. Or focus on connections. You know, I'm going to use the, the day that we have together to get to know people, to establish three new connections that can last for a long time. Or maybe it's the last one and you pick a course. Now, self-mastery is important, but the second one is focus. Now, one of my colleagues, Mark, one of his good friends, this guy named Bill, he moved to Kalamazoo, Michigan. Not too long ago, he moved there. And, and he wanted to get, uh, he moved, he wanted to buy a house right along the edge of the woods, and he actually did. He moved to a house right along the edge of the woods. And he wanted to have birds in the backyard, so he went to the hardware store and bought a bird feeder. He came home, he put the bird feeder up, he went inside, he had dinner with his family. When he came back out, he expected to see birds. Instead, he saw squirrels swinging from the bird feeder. Now, Bill is not a violent guy, but he knew that those squirrels would scare away the birds. So for the next two weeks, he waged war on these squirrels. First, he greased the post, he came, went back inside, came outside the next day, squirrels again. He tried everything he could think of for the next two weeks, so finally, he got fed up. He walked back into the hardware store. He asked the, the, the guy there, and he said, I have a problem. What should I do about it? The guy says, go down that aisle. You'll see some different bird feeders. Maybe the, one of those will work. He walked down aisle six, and he found what, he call, what they call a squirrel-proof bird feeder. Wire cage around, ugly as heck, supposed to keep the squirrels out. Bill took it home, set it up, and by that afternoon... Squirrels, again, were swinging from the squirrel-proof bird feeder. Now, Bill was upset. He grabbed it. He ripped it out of the ground. He went back to the hardware store. He, he said, I need to speak to a store manager. The guy behind the desk said, that's me. What's your problem? He said, I bought this from you, and squirrels are swinging from it. I want my money back. It says, satisfaction guaranteed, $24.95. I want my money back. The guy said, well, slow down. I could have told you before you bought it that that was not going to keep out the squirrels. Bill said, what do you mean? He said, there is no such thing as a squirrel-proof bird feeder. Bill says, wait a minute. You're telling me that an animal, a rodent with a brain the size of a pea, has outsmarted our smartest scientists, 
innovators, engineers. We can communicate anywhere in the world in a matter of seconds, and yet we cannot outsmart a squirrel with a tiny little brain. Store manager looks at him and says, well, yeah, I'm just not taking as much time to tell you. Bill didn't know what to do. Store manager says, let me ask you two questions, sir. Number one, how long have you been trying to stop the squirrels from getting in? How many, how many minutes a day? Bill says about 15 minutes a day. He says, that's what I thought. He says, question number two, how much time per day do you think the squirrels spend trying to get in? All day. 98% of their waking time. I looked it up. Squirrels are unique in the animal kingdom. Squirrels would rather forage than fornicate. That is the focus of the squirrel. Squirrels are very unique. And that's good news for us. Not the fact that squirrel-proof bird feeders don't exist, but the fact that focused attention beats brains and brute strength every single time. So the question then comes to us. How distracted are we? Are we really focusing at all times? The University of Michigan did a study, and they found that every 11 minutes, people, the average employee at every company in America is distracted every 11 minutes. So you come in at 8 a.m. in the morning. Let's assume that you don't get distracted right when you walk in. Your first 11 minutes, that's all you. No distractions. But after that 11 minutes, distractions start to happen. So 8 8-11, 8-22, 8-33, 8-44, 8-55, 9-06, 17-28, so on and so forth. Every 11 minutes you're facing an interruption. Somebody walks in, your email pings, your messenger pings, somebody stops by again and says, I need to ask you a question right in the middle of you doing your work. But then you think about it, well, if it's only once every 11 minutes, think about all the other time I had. So then they said, we're going to take this study further. How long does it take after that distraction to be, quote unquote, undistracted? Well, they found that it takes, anybody take a guess? How many minutes? Six minutes. Every 11 minutes to six minutes. Solid guess. So if you think about it that way, then you have a distraction. Oh, now you have five minutes. Woo! -hoo! All the work you can get done in five minutes after your 11 minutes and then your six minute, you know, lag time. But they found out it was not. It was 25 minutes. So let's think about what the day looks like. You have this distraction here. Oh, 25 minutes. Oh, next distraction. Oh, 25 minutes. Oh, your whole day, if you look at this bar, now these are not drawn to scale. But if you imagine that those are every 25 minutes, that those are every 11 minutes for 25 minutes, you, congratulations, from 8 to 8, 11 a.m., get the whole day done. It's all you. That, now, that, maybe that is what's called working smarter, not harder. If you can get your whole day done in that first period of the day, congratulations. You're going to be CEO pretty soon. But for the rest of us who fall into this category, it becomes very, very difficult. So the question is, what do we do about it? And that's a little teaser. The question is, what do we, you know, how distracted are we? Okay, Paul, yeah, that's some study, but I don't know that I'm distracted every 11 minutes. So what is the attention span of the average employee? Or to take it further, people who fall into the Gen Y and millennials category. I have a friend who owns a company that they analyze social media. People come to them, companies come to them, and they say, here's our YouTube video. We're getting a lot of views, but we don't know if people are watching it all the way through. It's a five-minute video. Can you analyze and tell us if people are clicking off before the end of it and where they're clicking off at? His company started to do that. Well, then there was this new thing called Vine. How many of you guys are familiar with what Vine is? Vine's a video company, but they're only six seconds. So companies said, well, we, sh we could pack a lot of information in six seconds and people will watch it because we know that attention spans are short. But if it's in six seconds, we can deliver information and people will watch it. So let's look at what happens. 
Try it again. Now that is not six seconds. That is 1.8 seconds. That is the amount of time that his company found that people are clicking off on Vine videos. Average click off time, 1.8 seconds. This is a movie preview for one of my favorite movies, Batman. What can you tell from this music movie preview? What in this 1.8 seconds makes you so bored that you're just like, God, I'm not going to get that 1.8 sec seconds back. I've got to click off. I mean, really think about it. That's, that's the attention span. That's the focus that we have because people are facing distractions all the time. So it's about strategy, systems, and sleep. Find a strategy that allows you to focus more. Develop a system. Whatever it is that works for you, use a system and get the right amount of sleep. I know that's kind of, well, that's not leadership development, but it is. NASA found that a 26-minute nap improved efficiency by 34%. 26-minute nap, 34%. Now all of you are instantly going to fall asleep this afternoon on your desk, and when your boss comes in, I'm going to get a nasty email because you're going to say, Paul told us that. But think about that, 26 minutes, 34% increase in efficiency. Focusing is going to transform your ability. So here are three leadership action points. Eliminate distractions, MVPs, and just be. We talked about eliminating distractions. MVPs, most people think of it as a sports term. I think of it as most valuable and profitable. As you leave here today, come up with a list. Six to eight things that are most valuable and profitable to you. Then spend 60 to 80% of your time every day doing those six to eight things. You still have time for other distractions because it's unreasonable for me to say, do a whole, only those things in the day because sometimes you just have things that you don't want to do that are not valuable and profitable to you, but they have to be done. 60 to 80% of the day doing six to eight things. If it's not on that list, eliminate it. And finally, just be. Take time every afternoon. Schedule a meeting with yourself. Just be. We're called human beings, not human doings. But yet we spend every waking moment doing something. We don't have time to think. Take time to just be. When you think about eliminating distractions, look at these questions. Helping me grow, the team grow, bettering our company. Focusing. We just talked about these three things. Finally, check with your team. Compare your list and just be it's as simple as that. Power with people. A few years ago, I did a consulting project in Brazil. I was hired in because the company was integrating. They called it an integration. I called it a merger. But to the employees, it was called an integration. That was a softer approach, they said. Now, the competitor had tried to do the same thing years before, and many people left the company. In fact, there were murmurings that that was going to happen at this company, that if they decided to do this integration, people were going to leave. The president of the company, we'll call him Joe Paulo, he came in, he spoke. He was one of those guys that you could just see it in his eyes that he believed in this strategy. So they integrated, and people stayed on. And so as I'm talking to these people, I'm asking them, why did you stay on? What, did, what was it that was so interesting that kept you engaged to stay on? And they said, it was simple. Uh, many of the people had been there several years, and they said, we knew Jao Paulo before he was CEO, before he was VP, before he was manager, when he started at the company. And he used to have a saying called, last on the lifeboat, before he was in any leadership position. I said, what, what, last on the lifeboat, what does that mean? He said, he had this saying that if everything was falling apart, the ship was sinking, and the team's project was going up in flames, he would be the last to save himself on that lifeboat, not the first. And he had that saying before he became a leader. And now that he is a leader, we are fully confident that, he, that if this integration fails, which it didn't, but if it does, if it had failed, that he would be the last on. So the principles, the things that you do right now, whether you have a title or you don't, people remember them. People will hold you to that. Power with people. Managers, they have power over people. 
Leaders have power with people. One of the easiest ways to have power with people is to simply appreciate them. One of my mentors is a, is a, name, a man by the name of Tom Mendoza. He used to be a CEO at a company called NetApp. NetApp was, is one of the largest storage companies in the world. He started there when they had five employees. They are now over 10,000. When the, when the company started growing, he realized he couldn't see everybody every day. He just couldn't appreciate people that he didn't know what they were doing. So he asked everybody, all of his employees, to catch someone doing something right. That was his strategy. He told his employees, if you see somebody doing something good, I want you to catch someone doing something right. I want you to send me an email, and I'm going to call them. I'm going to tell them who recommended them, who, se who sent me the email, and then I'm going to tell them what they did that was so valuable, that they did X, that they did Y, that they did Z, and ultimately what that means to the company. It's incredibly simple. But if you look up NetApp, you're probably, the first thing that's going to come up is probably one of the Fortune articles that has called it one of the best places in the world to work year after year after year, top five. And they're going to write up the article and they're going to talk about his strategy of catch someone doing something right. You don't need to be CEO to catch someone doing something right. You don't need to be CEO or president to stop somebody and say, hey, you know, that was my account and I know it was your day off, but I really appreciate you helping me out. And, and, and when we reach that sales goal, because we are going to, I know it's because of what you did on that day that changed things. If we appreciate people, we can be better leaders and have power with people. Five things to do. Be real, interested. And, and these are simple things but they allow us to move forward. Now, a lot of people say, well, Paul, I believe experiential learning is the best way to learn. I don't disagree that it's a great way to learn. But if you look at this study from the Center for Creative Leadership, 70% of what you do, the lessons you learn, the skills you develop come from experiential learning. But if you are only doing that and everybody else is doing more, you're going to get left behind. And so part of power with people, we talked about the coursework. We talked about seeing it as an opportunity, not an obligation. But it, the other part is finding mentors, finding people who can help you accomplish things that you want. And not just mentors that are above you. Find mentors that are starting in roles because their opinion is valuable as well. Maybe you've been here 10 years longer than them or, or three years longer than them. But they're going to remind you of those opportunities. They're going to remind you of how you used to think when you were in that role. Or maybe they're from a different generation than you. They're going to remind you that your customers, your consumers, might think differently than you do. A couple things. Relationship inventory. Think about the 10 most important relationships you have. Write those down. If you haven't spoken with them, send them an email. Give them a phone call. Think about your aspirational relationships and think about your ignored relationships. If you've ignored a relationship, you haven't contacted a mentor in three months, reach out to them. Four is persuasive communication. This is a picture of Abraham Lincoln. Most people know one of the most famous speeches of all time was Abraham Lincoln. What was it? Gettysburg Address. How many of you know that Abraham Lincoln was not the only one to speak that day? There was another speaker who spoke for over two hours. Abraham Lincoln did not speak for two hours. Instead, he spoke for ten sentences. But we remember him. It's not about the length of time. It's not about how much we say. It's about the power of clarity. Very simple. Another point is thinking about Feelings over words. I, I train corporate executive speakers. I train youth leaders. And I always tell them, think about the feelings before you think about the words, which is counterintuitive to a lot of ways that people develop speeches. They think, well, I'm going to write the words, and then I'm going to think about saying it in a different way. You can say a joke with a sad tone, and it's not going to be a sad story. 
It's thinking about how you want the receiver to receive the information and then framing the words around that. I'm going to do... So what are your 10 sentences and how can you develop those as a leader? But more importantly, who are you as a leader? I spent a lot of time when I was at Harvard training with the guy who actually built the narrative behind President Obama. And one of the things, if you watch President Obama speak, he does three things. He starts off a framework with what he calls story of self. Not, I'm President Obama, I went to Harvard Law School. But stories, challenges, choice points in his life that make up who he is. That's his story of self. And then he moves on to the next piece, and it's called the story of us. Story of self, then story of us. He talks about people that he's met. People maybe who, who General Mills, who your products have impacted, or employees who've gained value through a leadership training, whatever it might be that ties into your message. That's the story of self. And finally, he closed it out with a story of now. Some call to action. Story of self, story of us, story of now. Watch any speech of his or many other world leaders that have trained with this same guy. They all do that. And so if in the next week you can develop your own story of self, your ability to have power with people is going to be that much stronger. Strategic execution. I can tell you my experience at Harvard in five seconds. Ideas are worthless. I was in a business plan competition. I was in the top 10. HBS has an entrepreneurship conference. I was in the top 10 as a finalist. There was a kid who invented a new way to deliver uh, medication for AIDS patients around the world. It was like a Nicorette patch that you wore it on your arm, and it would get, deliver AIDS medication. Because around the world, in developing countries, they have a tough time getting people to take the medication at a certain time. I saw him speak. First thing I thought, I'm screwed. There's no way I'm going to win this competition. His project did not get picked up by the venture capitalists. I went and asked the venture capitalists. I said, that was an amazing, amazing idea, amazing plan. Why did you not pick up? Why did you not invest in his company? He said, I'll tell you why, Paul, because ideas are worthless. That kid hasn't done it once. He hasn't developed it. He has the plan. It might be great, but until he executes, it's worthless to us. One of my mentors always says, the road paved to hell is paved with good intentions. We can have intentions, we can have ideas, but until we start executing, it doesn't really matter. The quote by CEO of Porsche. Implementation quotation. People think of IQ, that develops your success. I think it does as well, but I think it's implementation quotation and not intelligence. Or quotient, not intelligence. 70% of executive CEOs that fail, they say they fail because they did not implement, they did not execute. One way to ensure that you can execute, dream big, plan small. Have big ideas, but focus on the small things. 10% of people execute if they hear an idea. 95% of people execute if they set up a time, someone to come back to, have an accountability partner. Plan out your first three steps, dreaming big, thinking small. Plan out your first three steps and be ready. Have an idea, know what you will do if you need to audible. The sixth point is simple. It's giving. One of Mark's friends is a guy named Charlie Tremendous Jones. He's one of the greatest phil philanthropists of all time. He came to his group of friends one day and he said, I am, I am giving up on giving. I don't believe in it anymore. He said, I am going to do something called returning. Because I believe everything I have, all my gifts, talents, time, is simply a gift to me, and I'm going to return it to those around me. It's, it's, it's the one thing that we often forget when we think of leadership development. We often focus on receiving, on bettering ourselves, on going to leadership trainings and ensuring that we grow, and we forget to think about returning, to think about mentoring people, to think about giving back to the community. And that's the sixth piece of leadership without a title. Your resume versus a legacy. 
what you've accomplished, results. You can read those up here. But a legacy is deeper. A legacy isn't about results. It's about relationships. It's not about self-improvement. It's about helping others improve. Soak that in for a second. And I want to close here with this because I know we're really short on time. I, something amazing has happened to me over the last few years, and I've started working with executive teams and leadership teams from giant companies. I've started training speakers, CEOs that work with thousands and thousands of employees, and I expected them to come in and to have all the right answers, to, to, that our training would be skills-based. But what I've found is that even with top-level executives, our training is confidence-based. People simply don't think they're good enough to execute. And as I close today, I simply say that you are here for a reason. You were hired at General Mills for a reason. And my hope is that you take some of these skills, that some of them click with you, that some of them resonate and you're able to implement in your lives. But more important than all of that, my greatest hope is that when you wake up in the morning, when you look in the mirror, when you think about the challenges ahead and the, and, the, and the world changing and the global economy and how General Mills is going to play a greater role in that, and when you think about your task that day as an employee and as you work your way up and as you try to have power with people, I simply hope that you remember that you are more than good enough. Thank you very much.